And we're just so happy. There's like, yay, this guy died. Yeah. He's dead. Yeah. He's, He's dead. dead. He's dead. Super glad he died. Frederick March. Cinematic Fantastic. Batu, Barada, Nikto. I'll show you who I am and what I am. By a werewolf and lives, becomes a werewolf himself. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Hello and welcome to the Cinematic Fantastic Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Weatherford. And your other host, William Weatherford. Get ready for opinions, dad jokes, and bad jokes. As we watch and review sci-fi and fantasy films from the classics of yesteryear to the new favorites of today. Content warning! This episode features discussion and movie clips relating to domestic violence and abuse. We feel that this is an important discussion and have decided to do this episode after moderate hesitance. Thank you! And welcome, amazing people Yeah, who are probably sitting out there in the millions and billions and trillions, as many minions as there are at the <laughs> Walmarts. That's how much you are. But welcome to the 17th episode of Cinematic Fantastic. Last episode, we covered The Vampire Bat, which I really liked for... A reason that I can now put into words a lot better, which was style points. Nice. I liked its style points the most. However, the movie we're doing today has a lot of style points as well, but in a like in a other sense, if you know what I yes. mean. Yes, I, I think it's got it's got lots to offer. It's got tons to offer. So yes. Today we are covering the 1931, we're jumping back two years just for a small little bit, the 1931 Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's time to hide from your destinies, I don't know. Yes, it's it's time to time to hide from your dark your darker self. Time to hide from our podcast. No. So, uh, I will tell you this though, just like we have in the past... Uh, apologized for quote butchering, uh, you know names and things like that, and, and of, of of people from other countries, you know, like French or German or Italian. We we've done that. We've tried our best, and we hope that you forgive us. But I will tell you, I am probably gonna say Jekyll. I know it's Jekyll, uh, like Treacle, uh, but I'm probably gonna say Jekyll, like you know. Because that's how it's commonly pronounced. Yeah, by 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 plebeians. Because you know. Yeah. This... <laughs> so this this story, the um, unfortunate tale of Doctor Jekyll, and Mister Hyde. I think it might be called. Don't quote me on that. But it has impacted the popular culture with a ton of different things. It was a really, really, really great story mm-hmm. as received. I mean, for Robin. Uh, Louis Stevenson, it wasn't like Treasure Island. Treasure Island was his most popular one, yeah. but this one was definitely up there in terms of his greatest hits and in terms of the greatest hits of English literature at the time. And I'm guessing that, I don't know if you guys knew this, but I sent the um, story to William to take and a look at. And I will at. be reading it. It'll be pretty good. It's pretty long, but it's not too long. That's why they call it a novella. Yeah. They add the law at the end to make it sound cool, but it's <laughs> really just a novel, but slightly shorter, I guess. Yeah. It's going to be pretty interesting to read. So, now that we jump into the movie, first thing is, this film, as all of the movies that we are covering in this season, is pre-code. Yeah. So the movie is known for its strong use of, shall we call it, legs. Yes, and, and also, you do see a little bit of side, you see a little bit of a, a, a some side skin for, of this uh, Ivy Pearson. Yes, Miriam Hopkins... The actor of Ivy Pearson demonstrates the use of legs very frequently in this picture. It's very, uh, quote, scintillating. So if you are a younger viewer and you don't want to see that, it you don't really, trust me, it's tame by today's standards. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, it, but your mileage may vary. But honestly, it's a really quick scene, 
and it's over. I think that some of the warning that I might give for other parts of the film, and when we go into the plot, you'll see what I mean, but they are in light of maybe young people whose parents maybe had a really bad relationship or, you know, there was some family stuff where the husband was very cruel to the wife. If if you're a young child and you're in that kind of if situation. If you've encountered domestic violence. Domestic violence, thank you. We'll be sure to give a word of caution toward this tale, or rather this movie specifically, and maybe a couple of its, of its versions. However, this one seems to be the worst and also the, well, the best like version yes as and, and compared to the spencer tracy one that we're doing in the future i haven't seen that one i've only uh but i will i will tell you that those scenes were kind of hard to watch they I, were very hard to watch but i'm telling you it, it's only because the writing is so sharp it pulls no punches the acting pulls no punches uh, i mean frederick march is just going for it and uh miriam hopkins is so conflicted and scared and she's yeah, they've this... done stuff with each other before as i've recalled i can't name like specific movies but i'm pretty sure they were together they were in a movie previous to this yeah they were in like a couple things like together overall that happens a that happens a lot of times i mean um i did not know that but that's 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 good i to mean know. we are focusing on a very specific line of movies but there are literally millions of fish in the sea in terms of movies, so there's bound to be some overlap somewhere where people somehow get in with each other in multiple different pieces. Yeah, and, and there weren't that many, I mean, to be honest, there's a good amount of actors in Hollywood at the time, but they're not tons. Uh, and, and generally, like, remember, remember we were talking about the Hollywood system or the... or The, uh, the MPAA, the Hayes Code. Well, no, no, not necessarily that. I was talking about the Hollywood system as in you would have Paramount... And they would have certain actors that were that would do a lot of movies for them. Oh yeah, contracts. Yes, and you would be contracted with them, and they would pair you up with people because you have to give them the rights to your being, obviously. Well, yeah, it's not quite. You can't I mean, just kidnap them and put them in your movie. You'd be like, I'm gonna kidnap Beyonce and put them in <laughs> our latest hit show. This this is not North Korea, uh, which you'll you'll learn about later. So what I can tell you about about this is is that. Uh, a lot of these actors did work together. You know, you know remember when we, were t- we talked about Lionel Atwill and uh, Faye Ray did some stuff to get uh, movies together before they did The Vampire Bat. It's just when you get two actors and they work really well together and they enjoy working with each other or at least have a good working relationship if, if they didn't have the greatest time, um, it, you get you get some good success. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I will tell you the things that stood out to me in this – before we go into this, is the acting is great, uh, playing the dual roles that Frederick March does of, of Dr. Henry Jekyll and Mr. Yes. Ed, uh, Mr. Edward Hyde. That was excellent. The makeup is quite, you know, ape-like and simian, if you want to return to Monkey. I mean, he looks very like what you might think of uh, Ape Man. They extend either, like, the front of his head or the back of his head, but somehow his head is extended. They put yes. teeth in there to make them jut out with fangs and stuff, and it's just pretty cool. Another thing, the camera effects. Oh, wow. The camera effects and all the camera shots were so, got so many style points. They're so nice and creative and really, really cool and lots of good effects that we can't. Ahead of their time. We Ahead cannot of their time. name every single cool shot, but there were so many times where i was like that's a cool shot yeah and we're used to that nowadays because people i mean we you want to talk about like a first person view there was a movie uh called hardcore henry where he was like a cyborg or something uh and he was it was an action movie and basically they filmed it with kind of a hybrid gopro kind of situation and also there was another movie called lady in the lake 1946 it's a mgm movie in which mm-hmm. the entire film is shot in first person. No. The entire film. Okay, I have to see some shots of that. You said it was 1946 Lady in the Lake? Yes. Okay, I you have to re- we got to find, kind of find some shots of that. You're it actually be MGM. MGM. Okay. Yeah, because they put out some great stuff. 
I oh, heard absolutely. They're, I heard they've been acquired by Amazon and are still doing stuff today. That's awesome. When you look into it, there's just, in terms of companies, there's a lot of, you know, companies buy out other companies, companies dissolve companies into their own, you know, companies convert them, maybe just like convert them into their own and just like go, oh, we're gonna, you know, this company, um, it's, we are that company now, we're just gonna put this label on it and say it's by this company, even though it's literally just us, there's no separate company. Yeah. yeah, it's just crazy in terms of buyouts and all sorts of legal stuff. But we are, are getting such tangential. We are tangential, man. That's what we do. So um, if you want to know, this movie was excellent. But we'll go into why it was excellent and who made it excellent. Um, you're right on, now. Buddy. Yeah, let's go, buddy. So it was re-released in 1936. But when it was, the code required eight minutes to be removed before it could be issued into theaters. But those minutes were brought back in the home media versions. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All the DVDs and the VHS got them. What were the eight minutes? Uh, I'm sure um, it was it the... It was uh... probably a ton of the, like, really iffy, you know, all sorts of that stuff that occurs in this The movie. murder? Maybe, maybe the they murder? They also cut the first person scene for some reason. What? They they literally did. I guess it wasn't that important to the story because you could just jump in straight to the he starts he starts his he starts his speech. Yeah, instead of all that getting ready, but yeah, they did cut that for some reason. Probably for time, and I I understand, but um, you know, and, and but I thought it was just it was well done. But I get it. I can understand. Uh, it, you know, you you don't really need it to move the story forward, but I thought it was really cool, and so that's why I like to see it in the full uh, uncut version. Yeah, because when you get cut things, a lot of times it can look kind of fakely censored, or it could just, in general, not be the director's vision. So, let's get into it. Yeah. Let's start with the transformation scenes. Oh, oh wow. So, yeah. the secret of how this happened was literally not revealed for so many decades. The director's first ever reveal of this knowledge was actually buried in a volume of director interviews. It was called The Celluloid Muse. And it was just buried in there, and then someone just found it decades later, and they're just like, oh, this exists. Now we know how it was done. Was it an interview with uh, Robert, uh, Ru sorry, Ruben Mamoulian, the director? Yes. Okay, yeah, and and I, I have seen a interview later with Rick Baker, who is a very famous um, special effects guy, and he's 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 very intimately cr uh, connected with like lots of gorilla and ape makeup, um, which we will talk about later. But um, that's pretty his, cool. His we'll we'll see some Rick Baker stuff as we go through these movies. I mean, we can't avoid. Him. I guess he, you're implying that he was in King Kong. Uh, Rick Baker later. Um, King Kong was mostly Willis O'Brien. And uh, and his uh, uh, his Padawan <laughs> learner uh, Ray Harryhausen, uh, but yeah, later Harryhausen was pretty cool. Later, uh, yeah, Rick Rick Baker comes in later, but he but he did like a little. They do these little interviews on these little, little special features on little horror uh, documentaries, and they were talking. He was talking about the special effects, and he re he revealed how it was done. And I I even saw a YouTube video where somebody tried to duplicate it, and they tried to do it. It looks. It looks okay, but I'm telling you, it, it's it's the it's film, it's black and white, it's and and, and it's the method. And I'm not, I'm not gonna spoil it. I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you go over the method. So the makeup was actually applied in contrasting color to you know the background, the skin, and everything. So there was also a series of colored filters that they put on the camera, you know, to slide over, and it matched the makeup, and they could slide it on and off to have granular control of the visibility. And a switch in color wasn't visible in monochrome, so what they could do is they could literally slide it, and then it would reveal the makeup that he put on his skin. So that the transformations could look like there was, like, creeping, creeping darkness over his body, which is pretty cool. That also makes Dr. Hyde, sorry, Mr. Hyde, <laughs> technically, he is blue in this universe. If you could see the color, he is blue. Wow. That's funny. Anyway, so his makeup for Hyde also became the most accepted depiction in media, or one of the most, because it's very representative of the animal 
the animalistic nature of sin. And also, it was so heavy, it potentially almost ripped Frederick Marsh's face off. And it even it, it sent him to the hospital after the film ended, so... Yeah, and, and I, I would specifically say the, the most painful of the makeup that I saw was toward the, the end. Well, the yeah, but toward the end... Um, yeah, his drooping face. Yeah, well, yeah, that, and they they, they pull his, uh, they use these wires or whatever, and they pull, you know, pull his eyelids down, and... Uh, that would be really painful. It'd be funny if uh, if uh, they were filming it, and, Car- and Boris Karloff, you know, just kind of visits, it and he goes, oh, huh. well, <laughs> hey, by, by the way, <laughs> mine was even worse. So Jack Pierce was like, hey, you know, I see that, hold my beer. Yeah, exactly. No, and then and then uh, I don't know if he was dead at the time. I don't think he was dead yet. But um, you know, Lon Chaney was like, "Hey, hold this big tankard of beer because I I put wires up in my cheeks and cotton." <laughs> and, yeah, if you want to go like the most painful of uh, of makeups, then it's got it's got to be it's got to be the Phantom. It's got to be the Phantom, hands down. But it's got to be it's got to be all the stuff that. Boris Karloff suffered through being Frankenstein, the mummy especially, like all that yeah. stuff as well. They went really hard on that. Yeah, and well, I mean, I would say the meticulous nature of, of makeup just got even more, sometimes went more meticulous because when you get, when we get to the Wolfman uh, with Lon Chaney Jr., they took like yak hair and they stippled it into the makeup. So it's, so it's just... it. It's it's not that they put it in there while Lon Chaney was wearing it. But it's that just was that... yeah. But that was one of the inventions of this movie. Another one was the characters of Muriel and Ivy Pearson, the girlfriends of Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, respectively. Man, like the stories didn't like need them really, but they're they they were great additions. But the the original story. Did not have them. Instead, they just, you know, they said that Mr. Hyde went on, you know, miscellaneous adventures. He didn't specifically have adventures with a specific person, if you get what I mean. Yeah, and but but I think in the the things that this movie is trying to put forward about really desire and, you know, and, and feeling that you... I mean, he, he's like, with Muriel, he's like, I, I want to get married really quick. And it's like, because he's, I guess he's burning with these desires and 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 so and when she puts off the marriage or well sort of puts it off she has to her father her father the general uh, Carew she forces her to go off to Bath to Bath England and uh so then what ends up happening he's like well I've got to go you know get these sinful you know actions out of my system it's so it's the struggle of 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 sin and your desire is just implicit in this character and of you know having these female characters in there um one a little bit more uh, on the other side of the tracks than the other i think that it does that- kind of emphasize that a lot more as well as they did with the makeup you know the makeup shows you know how animalistic you know the sin and desire can be, and it gets worse. It gets and the worse. Anger, and it gets worse throughout the picture. So more, more animalistic, more bestial. Yes. So also, apparently, they wanted uh, John Barrymore uh, from the 1920s Hyde. Um, he played Doctor Jekyll as well, and they wanted him uh, for this movie. But MGM had already contracted him. He literally just got contracted. Man. So then they got March, who he looked like him. And he also acted like him a little bit as well, as seen in 1930s The Royal Family of Broadway. And uh, his performance was so well received, he got an Oscar for it. That's awesome. A ton of people got Oscars over this movie. Did Frederick March get uh, the Oscar for Dr. Chico and Mr. Hyde, or did he get it for the previous film about the Broadway thing? Um, no. Um, Frederick March, he got an Oscar for Best Actor. For leading role, and um, Carl Struess, he was the cinematographer on this movie, I guess, and he also got an Oscar nom for cin- best cinematography. He got he, he got a nomination, yeah, and he, he deserves it because that it was. I mean, the, like we said before, we had nothing but good things to say about the camera work. Yeah, there was immense stuff. I mean, the unchained camera literally came into effect, and there were just like 
Let's see all the stuff we can do with it. I have my theories on how they were able to do some of those shots. And I, I might be wrong, but I have this theory in my head uh, that the camera was filming in a mirror in one scene. But it's not really a mirror. It's an exact duplicate of the room, and Frederick March is on the other side of it. Yes. That's what is happened. I, oh! I that it. is but, what happened. Because, and it makes because, sense anyway. Yeah. Because they can't, they can't, you know, you can't stand in front of a mirror and... Yeah, the thing is, the camera is a little too smooth for first-person so- shots for it to be, like, too believable. Because and the timing is like a little bit sweeping. off, too. The timing's a little off, too. But it was pretty great for the time. As well as, you know, that opening shot with the sideways head, <laughs> the sideways head silhouettes just waving back and forth. <laughs> I, I, th- I thought that was kind of funny. But well, on, honestly, you can you can you know suspend disbelief and just watch it and enjoy. And as long as you don't look at you know trying to look for the strings uh, that hold the puppets up, you this know this movie you, was pr- really pretty great. Yeah, I think I think it's a classic. It's it, it should be it should it should be heralded. It should be heralded. But thing is, it did not really seem like a like spectacular movie. But neither did Frankenstein really. I guess that's because it was going for. Um, part one and part two kind of thing. We get Bride of Frankenstein afterwards. That kind of, it was going for a part one, especially Dracula as well. But this movie, it was not planning for sequels. It was not planning for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde 2 Electric Boogaloo. It was, (laughs) yeah. Another thing to remark on this movie, now that I'm mentioning it, is because most of the movies we've been seeing at this time were one hour long. This one, from at least the full version... An hour and a half, maybe? An hour and a half? Yes, an hour and a half long. And the thing is, that's... I feel like having that extra 30 minutes just rounds out a movie. And in this day and age, I'm so used to it and stuff, that it's just like it rounds out a movie completely. So it makes them feel much more of a movie kind of, for the extra 30 minutes. I do, but I think that if a movie is going to spend the time, the shot, the, the things that you have in the film need to uh, contribute to the film. It does, it does. You know, it, 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 really, it really does. And sometimes there's other movies that are, you know, like 80 minutes long or, or 60 minutes long, and they get what they... They get what they want to do, and they do it well, and they get out. You know, <laughs> they, they don't like overstay their welcome. Like Frankenstein and Dracula were just like, hey, you know, we're going to put part one, we're going to put our part two later with uh, Bride of Frankenstein and uh, Daughter of Dracula, respectively. Well, da- Daughter of Dracula isn't necessarily, or, or even Son of Dracula, aren't necessarily um, follow-ups on that story. I would say Bride of Frankenstein is more because there's elements that were from Yeah, Bride the, the of book. Frankenstein was the part two to Frankenstein. Dracula's Daughter was probably the sequel to that. Um, having not watched it, I think it might do more with... I don't remember the name of the, like, girlfriend in that story. Like, the... No. The damsel. She got bitten, and so... You do see Van Helsing again, I think. You do but see Van Helsing. That's again. the on, that's the only uh, uh, connective tissue to this to these other Dracula movies. Is, yeah, is maybe the there was an actual part two in the works that followed up to that a lot better than Daughter of Dracula ever could. But I, they I, just I've, didn't se- I've seen them. I've seen them, and they're o- they're okay. But you know, they're just trying to you know play off of the uh, the legendary original, but Bride of Frankenstein in some ways is better than the original. And, you know, that's what I think. Yeah. But those movies do have big legacies. This movie also has a big legacy. There have been, as well as it being really, really great for English literature, there have been all sorts of stuff that, you know, copied it. Um, there was like, there was like a Bugs Bunny short all about it. There was, um, a really, really famous good one, it's, um, PBS Arthur has a song all about it where one of the characters sings Dr. Jekyll, Jekyll Hyde, Jekyll Hyde. Cause I was Jekyll, Jekyll Hyde, Jekyll Hyde, Hyde, Jekyll, Jekyll, Jekyll Hyde, Jekyll Hyde. It's really funny. There is also a, um, there was, I think, I think there is a, was a stage musical at one point, 
um, later on. But there have been so many remakes of the, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde story, it's not even funny. It's a really, really good premise. You know, you have the good guy and the bad guy, good cop and bad cop, all in one person and having to quickly scramble that potion into your lungs in order to <laughs> in order to not be discovered. I would even say the the Nutty Professor with uh, Jerry Lewis, which who was a comedy actor. That one actually, um, the the main character was a scientist who looked kind of goofy. He actually had goofy looking teeth, and he looked very much like uh, Mr. Hyde. But he was very, you know, you know, very. Uh, he wasn't great with the ladies. And then when he takes the the potion, he turns into Buddy Love, I think is his name, and he's he's all and he looks like a real handsome guy. So it's kind of like uh, a reverse of the two things but but buddy love is a jerk um which is kind of he's more like mr hyde he's kind of jerky there are a lot of different stories where they go let's put someone in a machine or like drink a potion or something and turn them into their evil versions and have them face off you know doppelgangers but that's that's a lot more separate from this idea a small little smidge in the case of like you duplicate them with the evil version but those are fun too, doppelganger stories. What? Well, the most famous one to me is the Hulk. Yeah, that's ultimately Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, but with a, a giant gamma irradiated brute. I mean, so I mean, he's green, but sadly, he's not blue. <laughs> I mean, he's not blue. He was originally gray, and then they they did him in green later. Yeah, so, and then and then gray again. <laughs> Let's not and get then into gray that. Okay, uh, abomination, man. Anyway, so. If you recall, we saw in our episode 15 about the old dark house that when Hammer made a version of their film, they eradicated Universal's rights to the story and the movie was presumed lost. Well, MGM did exactly that with their 1940s hide with Spencer Tracy, even buying it off them for $1,250,000. They, what, the they, they, movie they... was a lost film, and then someone had to discover it again, just because they literally went, nope, we're going to make a version that's better than your thing, and even buy the rights off of you so that you don't have access to your movie. Well, no one liked that version as much anyway, but the cookies had to crumble. Yeah, I, 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 I think that some people have said that there's some good things about the 1943 version with Spencer Tracy, but, um, it's, it's a, it's a skeezy business sometimes, you know, you know, they're basically going, we're going to squash your old version so we can make a remake of it. And it's, and of yeah, course people, this is, people are going to go, they're not even going to remember your story. They're only going to remember ours and then go and like, Hey, wasn't there a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde that came out sometime earlier in existence? I'm going to go see that. And they see the earliest one is their version and they get all the views. <laughs> yep. 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 And that's that's very common. But see, in in this, in this day and age, they literally of, just chucked sand. It's very hard to do. They chucked sand at Universal and ran off with the with the trophy. Except not really. It was a bronze trophy. But still, <laughs> this this movie was better, and it needed to be received for all the years that it is existing. And I'm so glad that we can we can see it again now in all its glory. And that other people can see it as well, and receive it well as well. Speaking of receiving it well, um, it was received mostly positive reviews upon its release. Morden Tall of the New York Times wrote an enthusiastic review, comparing it favorably to the 1920s version as a far more tense and shuddering type of movie. Yeah. He also praised March, the entire rest of the cast, and the costume and set design, and labeling it as delightful. Yes, I would, I would absolutely agree. Yeah, just good job on this whole cast. It was pretty good. We have Variety gave a somewhat less favorable but still positive review by Alfred Rushmore Greeson. He wrote that the climax wasn't effective enough because it was too slow to get to, but the first transformation scene was gut-wrenchingly effective, but it had diminishing returns. I kind of agree with that slightly, but I like that they make the transformation so smooth, especially with that transformation where he's sitting at the chair and they literally, like, arc the camera over showing him transform and his hands, and it's just so smooth and they just apply the makeup. 
that it just makes it so really cool that they did that smoothly enough that it could just be like you just smooth the camera over and he has makeup on. Oh my goodness. Yeah, sometimes you can you can hide the cuts. Uh there's a couple there's a couple times like before he get, looks over at the mirror and he does the little stretch thing the first time that he shows himself hide it does. There's a part where it kind of start it 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 pans down and then it starts to do the, do the doing the room spinning. There's a you can tell where it hides the cut. Yeah. You just have to piece it together at the frame. That's what they did. So he did like Hall, also praised the movie for March and the atmospheric, nice old set design and makeup. And uh, also, Film Daily, they declared the gripping performance by March gave it a strong dramatic highlight and it had an amazing supporting cast and direction. Yep. So Rotten Tomatoes, it got 90% Rotten Tomatoes for 40 reviews. Average 8.3 out of 10. The site's critical consensus reads, A classic, the definitive version of the Robert Louis Stevenson novella from 1931 with innovative special effects and atmospheric cinematography. Couldn't have said it better myself. Actually, I think I might be able to. This was Paramount's Frankenstein. Boom. Wow. Wow. That explains it a lot more, a lot better, because, you know, Frankenstein was really popular, uh, this film was also popular as well for Paramount. Yeah, same year. Same year. It was just Frankenstein, Dracula, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde were awesome. The whole movie was also on the end, the New York Times top 10 best films. Also, it was the very first film to be screened at the world's very first film festival, hmm. August 6th, 1932, in Venice, Italy. That's wow. awesome. Now we can get to our Ruben Mamoulians. Ruben Mamoulian, he was the director. I might probably I might probably butcher that saying it fast, but he was a uh, Armenian American, which I thought was interesting. We haven't seen any Armenians at this no, we, podcast we, we, before. We, we haven't. No. We haven't. In the interview compilation book directing the film, Mamoulian declared a strong pre- preference for a stylized look to his scenes stating that he was more interested in creating a poetic look to his films than in showing ordinary realism. He also famously directed The Mark of Zorro, 1940. Mm. Yeah. And this had great influence on Zorro as a whole, and it was also frequently referenced in the Batman comics. Yes. It is the movie that his family saw before his parents' deaths. I thought that was pretty cool. I haven't seen that version of it, but I did see the Disney version. is called uh, The Sign of Zorro. I thought that one was pretty cool. Um, I thought that was really great. However, I haven't seen the other ones, and I think they could possibly be better. Maybe it's just that Disney, you know, could have possibly kidified it, concerning that The Sign of Zorro is rated G for everyone. And um, I don't know the ratings on top of my head for all the rest of us, but I'd be interested in watching with you, Dad. Yeah. Those are great of, ones. The Mark of Zorro was made in 1940. It's, po- it's post Hayes Code. Uh, but, yeah, it's probably, I think that, the, it, don't quote me on this, I wonder if it's, Ty- is it Tyrone Power who played? Uh, uh, Zorro? Zorro, Don Diego de la Vega. Um Honestly, we'll have to wait and see. We'll to, let's see if we can find a copy of that somewhere. Uh, and so, we'll watch the Mark of Zorro. So right now, uh, the two things we need to be on the lookout for, Lady in the Lake and Mark of Zorro. So Pretty we'll good. do that. Yeah. So let's get to Frederick March. Yeah. So Frederick March, he played Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, respectively. And he was regarded as one of Hollywood's most celebrated, versatile stars of the 1930s and 1940s. He won an Oscar for Best Actor for this movie, and uh, also for the Best Years of Our Lives, 1946. He also served in the U.S. Army during World War I as a artillery lieutenant. That's wow. Cool. In uh, 1920, he began working as an extra in movies made in New York City, using a shortened form of his mother's maiden name. Pretty cool. And um, he appeared on Broadway in 26, and by the end of the decade, he had signed a film contract with Paramount, and that's how he got slingshotted into the film career. Nice. So, obviously having won the Oscar for Best Actor, oh, he also got an Oscar for another movie he did, or rather was tied for it, by Wallace Beery for The Champ. Although March accrued one more vote than Beery, um, it was a tie between them for that Oscar for that movie. 
question. Uh, Wallace Beery was. Um, I think we've seen him before in the, the Lost Silent World. Era. The Lost World. He was World. in the Lost World. Was he director? No, he's Professor Challenger in the Lost World. Oh uh, yeah, that was him with the, with the beard, the big beard. He was the one that uh, had a lot of uh, arguments with people. Uh, and people the thing didn't. is, I wonder what he looked like in the 1930s. As compared to the nineteen twenty, didn't the champ have uh, uh, Jackie Cooper was like this little boy, uh, and then the, and then Wallace Beery was the champ, you know, the the prize fighter. Um, that's I've seen him without a beard, and you know he looks different, but you know. So he was in. This led to roles in a series of classic films uh, based on stage hits, classic novels. He did a bunch of stuff. He did Les Miserables is uh, 1935 with Charles Lawton, interestingly enough. They did that. So next one is another notable one is uh, Anna Karenina, 1935 with Greta Garbo as the original Norman Maine in A Star is Born. And that's where he did his, his third Oscar nomination. And um, that's all the notable stuff there. But Anna Karenina is a pretty, pretty like pretty classic novel, I guess. So maybe that one's a good read. Also, uh, something interesting: uh, Spencer Tracy also played Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde, just like Frederick March did, and they both were in a movie together uh, called Inherit the Wind. Yeah, let's just let that sink in. That yeah. was pretty cool. They're both in it probably contending for something <laughs> on set or something, and they're just like, I'm the better Jekyll High. I don't know. I can just imagine it. They're contending because the two characters they play uh, were opposite each other in the... Uh, Inheritance of Winds. Inherit the Wind was the Scopes Monkey Trial, I think, which basically was about uh, the teaching of evolution in school. Also, we get March's neighbor in Connecticut, playwright Arthur Miller, was thought to favor March to inaugurate the part of Willie Loman in the Pulitzer Prize winning A Death of a Salesman. That's a play. And yes. It's, um, it did win a Pulitzer Prize, and those are pretty, pretty prizey. So he did turn it down, though, after reading the play script himself, but he then regretted it, so he played it in columbia's 1951 adaptation pretty cool he also played one of the two leads in the desperate hours 1955 with humphrey bogart we'll watch something with him sometime soon so next is ellen miriam hopkins as ivy champagne ivy is her name champagne ivy is her name i don't know the rest of the lyrics my boys <laughs> champagne ivy is So, she received a nomination for the Academy Award for Best Actress for the 1935 film Becky Sharp, also directed by um, Mamoulian as well. Ah. So that's probably where he knowed of her. So... By which she also earned the distinction of being the first performer nominated for a performance in a color picture for an a Academy Award, otherwise known as an Oscar. Yes. Um, she, she co-starred with Joel McCrea in five films. We saw him in The Most Dangerous Game along with Faye Ray. Um, that was a pretty good episode. Go watch that. It's pretty cool. It's a classic. So Hopkins also auditioned for the role of Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. And was the only candidate to be a native Georgian. Well, yeah, and uh, Gone with the Wind takes place in the state of Georgia. It's uh, during the Civil War, uh, you know, during the latter days of it. Uh, I believe it wasn't it Vivian Lee and played Scarlett O'Hara, and Clark Gable was in that. Yeah, Vivian Lee was the one that they chose after all the cards settled, but um, she did not accept. Yeah, Vivian Lee is very iconic in that role, and, and uh, as God is her witness, she'll never go hungry again. That's the line. As God is, as God is my witness, I will never go hungry again. She's just going to eat every no. <laughs> single thing. She's going to eat the wind, but the thing is, it's gone. <laughs> anyway, let's get to You're Rose Hobart me. as Muriel. The other contender for the love of Dr. Jeevil. So, one note is the House of Un-American Activities Committee uh -oh. investigated her 
1949, this is the only note I've got of her, but Huak is... It was a pretty big thing of this, just particularly in the film industry, when it hit in 1940, because they're like, let's look for communism in the movies. They were looking at it in the actors, you know, the actors... Yeah, the were... actors could have been communists. Thing is, I haven't heard of Huak before, um, before we started this podcast, so I really need to look at that and... You know the history then, because I don't know too much about Huak and like what the times were like um, when they came into effect. You know, rooting out communists and how it was important. Uh, it was during the fifties. It was often called the Red Scare because uh, communism was the red menace. And it was funny because not funny, but interesting that we uh, we were uh, teamed up with um, uh, with the con- with with communist Russia to fight the Nazis in World War II. But uh, Stalin was, I would say Stalin is probably, I know that some people will, won't agree with me, but I think Stalin was in some ways, in some ways now, worse than Hitler. And we were teamed up with him. So it's almost like you, it's, it's the devil, it's teaming up with the devil you know to fight the devil you don't. And, but we were very quickly... It's like getting Elvis Presley for your boy band. Wow. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know how even to take that. But <laughs> the uh but during but during the 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 50s, uh communism was the big scary thing, not only from communist China, uh but, p- but from Russia. So the big bad uh people would definitely be uh the Chinese government and the Russian government. Um you'll see you'll see this when we get to those movies that you know, at the time, they everyone was afraid of of nuclear uh, radiation, nucle- nuclear bomb. Yeah, all sorts of stuff in New uh, World War Two. As we're gonna get to that in the fifties, that took over the fifties. But we've we've gone past World War One. World War Two, uh, not yet. World War One didn't quite hit until nineteen forty one, full on, and it ended in nineteen forty five. Um, but during the fifties, it would have been the Korean War in the middle, uh, and, and, and that was in the... That was in Korea, obviously. Of, of course. But the, the thing is, the at the end of uh, World War II uh, was the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that definitely fed into the fears uh, n- not only of what we, we did, but what someone else could do. And especially Pearl Harbor after that especially fed into... Pearl Harbor was... was uh, in 1941, I think, uh, and that's what kicked us in in the pants and in getting into World War II. Um, All right, so yeah. let's talk about this last person because yeah. we're almost done with the production, and it yeah. was pretty fun, I guess. So we've got Edgar Norton as Poole. He is the butler, and um, aged 18, he appeared as the hair in the original production of Alice in Wonderland in London in 1886. That is the play. Um, with the production being under the guidance of Lewis Carroll himself. Wow. Uh, and he saw the musical five times as well. Um, we'll also see him in Dracula's Daughter and Son of Frankenstein, funnily enough, as Butler character. Wow. When you get uh, when you get typecast, you just got to lean into it, I guess. He, he does the part really well. You know, he's got his good sirs and his really good sirs and his <laughs> here's your scarf and hat, sir. Yeah, you've got the you got similar lines every time you play it, and you just have to just get in, do your thing, and get out. Not 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 too much to do. I was also going to say that uh, previously you talked about about Rose Hobart as Muriel Carew. She 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 honestly, Miriam Hopkins got the better lines and the better part because she mm-hmm. really gets to show more depth and show her her anguish uh, and the horror that she has to deal with, and she had to you know. So I. I would say that you know, Poole, uh, he's he's okay. I mean, he's 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 a supporting actor. You know, there's no small parts, only small actors, and he does that. He does what he's supposed to do. Um, you know, and he's he's service serviceable is the word I would say. Uh, but really, you can't keep your eyes off of 
uh, Frederick March and Ivy Pearson because they they just put so much. They put so much effort into it. They probably even did some stuff that they weren't asked to do, but were like I feel it in the moment. Let's do that. Oh, you oh you mean like really yeah really just just going method on it. Yeah, especially just feeling the pain as Miriam Hopkins is just suffering domestic abuse and just overall this person just being forced onto her and her life and literally sucking her dry of everything that she loves. Yeah, and she can't get away. And she go and she strangely enough, she goes to the very man she remembers from the beginning of the movie, you know, as having a kind heart and being an angel. And little does she know, it's the same guy. The devil the devil is right there. You know, that she's begging for help against the devil. He is the devil. And it's just, just like, and also an angel at the same time, as as uh, as we all are, I would say. The duality of nature of man is just that, you know, you get some people, you know, they're philanthropists. They do awesome things for this country, you know, solving world hunger and beating cancer in the face because it's really terrible for everyone. You get cancer, you're probably dead in like a couple months or a year or two but seriously there are also some people who also can just you know mess up people and their lives and just take them over for themselves yeah you find you find uh really skeezy details about some of the even the best people you know you find out oh these these people are really great and then you find out that they had secrets and things in sin that they kept hidden uh you know these and and honestly, the way that Doctor Jekyll puts it, he, he he basically says we've almost got to let it out uh, and give it allow allow him give to roam being. free. Yeah, and and I honestly thought he wanted to to separate it from himself, like almost like uncage it, but put it off to the side and but make him he, have no capability of it even. Yeah, but what he ended up doing is giving all his all the the agency to to Edward Hyde. And to just to just explode upon the humanity. Yeah, exactly. And also, you know, the desires that um, that Jekyll had. You know, he he let them roam free and hide, and uh, horror ensues. And just gets it. Just ends in a straight up murder. Yeah. Well, not only not only him murdering others, but he murdered himself. That's interesting thought. Yeah. So. Uh, so what else can you say about this movie that we haven't said? What other uh, praiseworthy thing can you give it that we haven't already given it? There is just so many good camera shots that I literally can't name all of the good ones, but there are absolutely tons of ones that are just, they just are so creative. Especially some of the ones where they focus on like Greek character statues yeah. at certain points of the movies. So that's kind of like symbolism for certain things. I looked it up, and it seems one of them references uh, Cupid and Psyche, which, oh. as I can recall, where there were like two people, but they couldn't like get together, basically. It was never meant to be or something like that. Because it was that. never meant yeah. to be. Well, another thing that I would look at, too, is um, if you think about it, Greek, you know, the Greek gods, you not only had the, this higher... Uh, this higher kind of function of the of the gods, where they're supposed to be above us humans, but if you think about it, they still uh, do sin. They, yeah, yeah, the gods. I mean, are, even the Zeus, gods are worse. Than, yeah, even Zeus in the mythos, quite literally, he just transforms into animals. Quite literally, he goes out into animal form and he goes to his ladies and he indulges himself upon them. Yeah, it's it's horrible, and 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 the thing is, we are supposed to have uh, we're supposed to be human, uh, and 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 str and struggle towards the divine in us, and give uh, feed that divine nature in us, and let us you know make uh, higher minded choices, but also we have the uh, the opportunity within us to make these devilish choices too so and and that's and i mean i also think it's interesting that zeus transformed himself before oh, going out into the world that's into, also into, into beast into beast into a beast 
So the head the, in order to the, the people, yeah. they just be like, "Oh, it's just a swan. Oh, it's just a cow." Well, so oh, did Doctor Jekyll. Just, so did Doctor Jekyll. He tra- he he went he went to beast mode, as uh, you you Gen Zers would say. So that is our podcast. It was pretty fun talking about stuff. There's definitely all sorts of stuff that we can talk about. So much stuff that we've missed. But this one should be such a popular movie that there are definitely podcasts about it as well. And in general, the book as well, there are some stuff about that and just the philosophies as well. It's just a really great story. And I mean, it's definitely up there with Treasure Island with uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's work. That's how I would do it is Treasure Island, um, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, and I don't really know all the others but if you if you can name a couple others dad that would be i can't third and fourth. I, I can't i can't think of any i keep thinking those of, are his best those are yeah. the ones that are recognized the most by Robert yes the, there's some there's some other ones uh that but those are the two most recognized i would say one thing that as we're going through the plot i'm definitely going to point out some uh some elements that really stood out to me uh, in terms of the stylistic nature of, of, of you know, like, you know, we, we noticed the things about the gods and the statues and stuff. I noticed some things about uh, camera angles and what they chose to focus on that, that I will talk about. Um, but, yeah, we're definitely going to go into the plot. We're going to rock that. So see you then. See you then. And welcome back, listeners, from the break. Uh, just a little note. You'll probably notice that my voice is a little bit deeper. Um, I that is get- recovering <laughs> from some sickness. It's not the sickness that you're thinking of, hopefully. <laughs> but um, the only thing that is wrong with him right now is his voice is a little deeper. That's what happens um, when you get sick. I don't really know why. It happens with men. I don't know if it happens with women, but I think it happens with men. <laughs> well, I, I so. think it's I think it's because a lot of my sicknesses, if they deal with, um, you know, my nose or my throat, that yeah, they congeal in there. Yeah, this is really this is really lovely to talk about with our listeners. You know, the the ooey gooey nonsense. Well, that's just of, a pad. That's just a passing thought. Let's go get it on down with the plot. Yes. So what I'm gonna uh, I will I will warn you guys, our faithful, faithful, lovely listeners. Um, I will warn you that I know it's pronounced Jekyll. I know that. But I will probably say Jekyll and Jekyll in equal amounts. And that sounds like a Dr. Seuss rhyme, I know. But I think there's um, there's a cartoon birds, they're like crows, called Heckle and Jekyll. And I think that that is what has messed my brain up with saying Jekyll in all general, the time. In general, everyone says Jekyll. I, I really think, yeah, there's a song, okay. Now, I, I let William listen to a song. There's a song by a, a – this is a, sl- a slight tangent. We are the ch- tangentlemen, after all. Uh, there's a song from the rock Christian rock band Petra from back in 2003 called uh, Jekyll and Hyde. And it, it, he, in it he says, sometimes I feel like Jekyll and Hyde. He doesn't say, sometimes I feel like Jekyll and Hyde because I guess people That's wouldn't know. That's how people commonly pronounce it. It's all right. That's how they pronounce it, yeah. It should be changed. Thing is, no one does it, so... <laughs> well, if you think about it, if you... Just a quick... I I'll, I'll, I'll promise I'll steer this back to the plot. So I was thinking, you know, the previous versions of this story that were done in live action were silent. So they didn't have any pronunciation guide on the screen. You know, they could have been saying Jekyll the whole time in because in, it was silent. It was silent. a book. No one could know. The, yeah, the book didn't say how to pronounce it. It's just as soon as we got the movie, they were like, Jekyll, Dr. Jekyll. And I'm like, okay, all right, you, you, you told me how to say it. Let's get into the plot with all of those disclaimers out of the way. As- yes, and like any of these good, really, really good movies that we've done, it starts out with music. And, of course, this music is pretty public domain, I think, even for... Uh, them at the time. It's uh, Toccata and Fugue in D minor. And it's like, hey, he's been dead for, uh, <laughs> Bach has been dead for like a century before this about. Is he 1700s, 1800s? Um, 1700s, I think. Sometime in like the 1800s, I think. Anyway, it's a Bach piece, of course. For some reason, I associate uh, Toccata and Fugue with Phantom of the Opera for some reason, because sometimes when people have him playing 
Uh, and I know he's not actually playing that in the movie, in the silent film, but when he's playing it, he's playing it there. I don't know if I remember that or 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. In I think. general, it's played by an organ, and organs evoke a fan of the opera to an extreme. Also, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Captain Nemo has one. You know what? I don't remember if it's in there, too. I think it's just in my head space. So anyway, there's a reference to Bach coming up because Dr. Jekyll says that Bach doesn't even keep his butler pool from bothering him. Um, so he's kind of like, you know, I just want to play. Please let me do that. So at the very beginning uh, of this movie, we get those really, really nice first person shots. We get some of you those. Know, the l- head swaying back and forth sideways somehow. Oh, the, the false head. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't want to d- you know, destroy your, your uh, amazement at, at how they did but this. It's but it's not truth. It's false head. Right. <laughs> false head. <laughs> it's falsehood and false head. So anyway, um, what you know? What they're doing is they're doing the first person view. I have a theory as to why they're doing it, but again, that's something that I just took away with it. It, um, and I think I'll probably mention it a couple times during talking about the plot is that there's a little bit of hide in all of us. There's evil in us. It's not just evil in Doctor Jekyll that could come but out. But it's in it, all of us. It's hiding inside of us ooh, to the point that yeah. we have to seek it out. I mean, even the book. Did you know that even the book knows the pun? He even there's even a line at the beginning. I'm reading the book slowly. You'll have you'll have to give patience with me, and because I haven't finished the book yet. That's okay. But uh, at the beginning, there's a line where the detective guy he's like, "If you are Mister Hyde, then I shall be Mister Mister Seek." Seek. Right, yeah. Mister Seek. Yeah. Even the even Robert Louis Stevenson knows of the pun. Oh, he he knows. So get those nice first person shots. And I think you were talking about when they, you know, re-release this years later after the Hayes Code. Um, they probably they clip. You said they clipped out scenes of this at the beginning, probably for time purposes. Because after all, it's an hour and thirty minutes. But thing is, I appreciate that hour and thirty minutes because I do too. The extra thirty minutes just it just rounds it out and it makes it seem like a movie, like an actual movie, instead yeah. of you know cutting short. It does. In this case, it's not. I don't think it's extraneous. I don't think it's just useless. I think that when I watched it for the first time, I watched those first person shots and I went, is this 1931? How did they pull that off? And then I started, and the more I thought about it, oh, that's how they're doing it. You just have to think, okay, remember back to our Dracula episode, or I think we actually talked about it in our Frankenstein episode instead, but the the unchained camera yes. could do so many things. And so they're like, well... How about we position it to look like someone's head moving around? Yeah, but those cameras were pretty big and and noisy, so they it was hard to move those around. But uh, who who was it that that came up with the unchained technique? How how's your memory on that? It was a uh, it's Carl Frund. Oh yeah, Carl Frund. Okay, yeah, he did the unchained uh, technique, and of course everybody used it going forward. I mean, you know, when you come up with something so great. Anyway, so we get to his butler pool, as you know, he's like, "You've got a speech at three in fifteen minutes," and so you've got to head out the door. So he just, you know, he gets his cane, he positions his tie and whatever, his all sorts of stuff, his hat. We see his face uh, for just a moment there. And uh, I know how they did the trick, but I he's actually – the mirror is not a mirror. It's kind of a hole in the wall in a way with an exact duplicate of what's in front of that. It's a very it's a very nice magic trick. The thing is this costume that he wears is also pretty famous costume for Dr. Jekyll. Anyway, so, you know, he heads out by the coach and he arrives at the school. So he goes in the classroom, and you can you can hear people kind of before he's about to speak. They He appears to be kind of famous for shocking uh, things that shock the establishment, saying things that are controversial, and he does not. He d- definitely does that. Today I want to talk to you of a greater mob, the soul of man. My analysis of this soul leads me to believe that man is not truly one, but truly two. One of him strives for the nobilities of life. This we call his good self. The other seeks an expression of impulses that bind him to some dim animal relation with the earth. This we may call the bad. These two carry on an eternal struggle in the nature of man, yet they are chained together. And that chain spells repression to the evil, remorse to the good. Now, if these two selves could be separated from each other, 
how much freer the good in us would be, what heights it might scale, and the so-called evil, once liberated, would fulfill itself and trouble us no more. I believe the day is not far off when this separation will be possible. Yeah, wow. A lot of the people in the classroom, they do think he is a lunatic. Um, they start talking about, I think they start, one guy says, Yeah, maybe I should send my other part to school. <laughs> right, exactly. So, so I think they're not really taking it seriously. But of course, he doesn't really have any proof of his, um, it's very metaphysical. He's saying that there's something you can do, but it really does sound very spiritual and metaphysical. Unlike a lot of the other movies in this where people think that they are God, or want to be God, uh, Dr. Jekyll actually does, you know, mention God several times in this. Uh, he does believe in the soul. He does believe in in sins and things like that. So that's kind of an interesting part of it. Instead of him just going, uh, you know, I'm, I'm better than God, he's kind of like going, well, you know, I wonder if he wants to kind of please God in a way, in, in his own crazy way, but I he goes about it in a bad way, which a lot of these scientists do. So anyway, Lanyon is uh, his friend, I guess, that also works at the university. And uh, Lanyon tells him that they have to make the Duchess's dinner. And she's not his fiance yet, but Mur uh, Muriel Carew and her father, G the General Carew, very big characters in this. They're going to be there at the dinner. And if he shows up late, it's just going to look really bad. But he's like, um, I'm going to be late. I'm sorry. I'm doing some charity physician work. Yeah, can you please give the Duchess my compliments and some castor oil? Right. That was, she's, that was uh, a she's... really funny line. Please give uh, the Duchess my compliments and some castor oil. And some castor oil. She's, bil she's bilious, more in spirit than in body or something. He's basically saying, this is also something I'll tell you soon. It's, it, she's, he's basically saying, she's fine. She's not really sick. This is just something to kind of like a placebo effect, like it's in the mind, which I, I actually have a comment on that in just a minute. So he says a line... It's a really interesting thing. He says that the things that are said that he cannot do, that he gets most tempted by. It's the things one can't do that always tempt me. So you see him take care of a little girl and an older woman. Uh, I think that these are important scenes because they do show him at least being a good guy, right? Even though he's helping someone in the free wards, I mean, he doesn't even get any money for caring for her for all of the years. <laughs> he's just helping out. And later, the general, General Carew, he, like, makes a comment about, uh, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like, what, he wants him to only do paid work so that he, because he's trying to... Because it's just something that isn't, it's something that isn't worth it to take care of this one singular person. So it's like, why do you want this particular person? <laughs> Why aren't you making your worth out of this? Well, there's certain there's certain things that he that the general prizes like punctuality, and uh, you have to do things according to these strict Victorian rules, like waiting so long before you get married, and and waiting but so yeah, long before are... you ask. We're I know we're getting ahead. So, uh, on a rewatch of those scenes with the little girl and the older woman, there is the illness with her le with girl little girl's legs, and the other lady has a fear. Over, uh, over the over the cure, uh, you know that I, I'm scared, right? But it's all in their mind, right? Psychosomatic is what they call that. Um, it's like what happens in the mind affects the body. Like for instance, she's there and she's she like feels like she needs the crutches, but she actually doesn't. So she's just randomly getting the crutches. Like, no, you don't need those. It's like I do. It's kind of like a reverse placebo effect. In fact, yeah, where it's kind of like. You need to not... Or I thought of this, too. Um, well, you know, when he takes the potion, he turns into Hyde. What's going on in the mind reflects out of the body. So, also had a thought, too. I, I don't think this the movie really says this, but is morality and, and, and virtue, is that the crutch? And if we just cast those aside, we can run? My goodness, is that far-fetched a little that's bit? That's a little deep. But, All right. and that's that's psychosomatic... That's what we were talking about, psychosomatics. So, so Henry says he's going to be late because he has to perform an operation on the lady. He's going to miss the dinner. He'll be there for the dancing, though. Uh, along with the first-person shots, they have these wipes in there that are really interesting. They're kind of like comic book strips, uh, strips because they split the screen in different ways that are dramatic, and, and they create a juxtaposition. I really like that. I really like them, too. There are many more movies with really good shots kind of like this, but... 
nothing compares to this movie's. Nothing is equivalent. Excellent job. There is a movie that, that we're going to watch uh, uh, much later that overdoes it, and I think to a detriment. It embraces that aspect of comic book panels, um, and it it kind of makes me queasy. I hate it. It's it's, uh, it's called Hulk. It's by Ang Lee. I think it came out in 2003. It uh, A lot of people kind of scratching their heads going, what is going on? But when you see it, you'll understand what I'm saying. Uh, it's got some good stuff in it, I think, and some bad stuff as far as choices that, that Ang Lee uh, made. But anyway, um, I think you can overdo it with, the, with the, all the wipes and splits and stuff. So when, Landon, when Lanyon gets to the party, he tells Muriel, uh, that's uh, uh, Henry Jekyll's girlfriend, right? And the general, her father, that Dr. Jekyll is going to be late because he's helping out in the free wards. Uh, like I said, the general places a lot more weight and importance on punctuality than anything else. He's very pragmatic. Um, there's, not, there's no morality about him at all, I think. It's just, just kind of like what serves the best purpose. You know, like, um, we do the things we do because that's what we've always done. Like, uh, when they talk about uh, marriage, oh, well, you have to wait such and such because I did. Or we have to, you know, you have to do, actually have the wedding eight months from now because that's when me and my wife's anniversary you know, is going to be. he cares so much about specific times, but he doesn't think about the times that he does have. Yeah, so, Yeah, he's kind of like, he doesn't appreciate the time that he's got. Instead, he's like trying to optimize his time in this world and it's like you need to enjoy it too he wants his daughter to be to be cared for yes but provided for and that's why he's kind of upset about him working for free um but honestly muriel loves the fact that that he's actually there is a kindness there anyway but it but it does it does get him into trouble soon as we'll soon see so lanyon is happy because hold with, with, up yeah one thing that most people would miss it's a small Easter egg. Oh. Um, when the scene ends, um, the excuses are made, and then, you know, he's accepting people into there. One of the people who's accepted into the ball, uh, the dance, is um, Utterson. Ah, uh, Utterson. For like a moment, but yeah, Utterson is actually in the book, and most people wouldn't know that. And in the book, it's kind of like in media res, to where, you know, we have Utterson, you know, he's like a lawyer, but he's also doing, like, detective work trying to figure out, you know, the story of Jekyll and Hyde. Like, after the fact. Like, after the fact. But I don't know if that would work very well. I mean, it works really pretty well in another movie we're going to see uh, this is, year. It also it also technically makes um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde a detective story, considering it's also named The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Not the unfortunate case, though. <laughs> I made that mistake. Um, I couldn't recall the word strange. But, right. and that's strange. Anyway. So, uh, Lanyon gets to dance with Muriel, but it doesn't last very long. Um, so, Jekyll, Jekyll comes right in the door. He wants to talk to Muriel, so he dances her out into the garden where they can have a better discussion. He doesn't want to wait any longer. He wants to be married as soon as possible. Um, I was telling William earlier that this part reminds me of... Uh, there's a part in the Bible in the New Testament where you got the Apostle Paul, and he says that if you that he encourages he, he gives advice a lot of times to the early church, and he says to the young men out there, he's like, if you're burning with passion, it's better for you to go to you to get married than to you know give in to sin and stuff like that. So it just seems like he's like, I'm going crazy out here, baby, and we got to get married. That's what it feels like to me because. If you think about, you know, like there's a part where he's tapping his foot like he's a nervous wreck, but we'll talk he's about that He's very impatient in this movie, and General Carew is going, you need to be patient. Well, why this impatience? Think it all men, it isn't done. It isn't done. If it is eccentric to be impatient in love, sir, I am. But if you didn't yeah, know, Yeah, he's Dad, right. He's kind of right. Yeah, but if you didn't know, Dad is a Bible nerd, and he really likes to study all sorts of stuff about it, and even if you don't, regardless of your religion, um, you can still appreciate some interesting things about the Bible and biblical events as well. Well, and also also the other, the other part of that, too, is, you know, it is literature as well. And the thing is, a lot of, uh, a lot of these movies will have a lot of things in them that, that, that talk about it. I mean, there's a whole scene where, you know, this, this movie is, 
you know, for uh, for its pre Hays Code stuff. I mean, if you overlook that, this is a, a movie about, you know, somebody dealing with, you know, desires and urges and sin. And, and it, it, it comes out and says it. I mean, he there's a whole part where he in the future where he ta- he, he looks up to heaven and talks to God. He pleads for for absolution. I mean, you know, that's it's and the Bible deals a lot with sin as well. So that's the connection for those. It is. It is. And, and also a lot of these movies are people either, you know, saying either saying God doesn't exist and then they're moving forward with their scientific horrors that, you know, shock the world. We're going to see a lot of those over the years. You know, man kills God. Uh, man makes dinosaurs. Dinosaurs kill man. <laughs> Woman <laughs> inherits the <laughs> inherits the earth. Uh, you'll know what that means if you've seen Jurassic Park. But anyway, so back to this. He doesn't want to wait any longer. They come in. Uh, she says her father's difficult uh, and he's, he's difficult to deal with. So they come and talk to the general. General wants to get married on his anniversary, on the general's anniversary, which is eight months from now. He doesn't, doesn't want to wait that long. He thinks that uh, Jekyll's impatience is obs- obscene. You know, he says, this is most positively indecent. And that, that quote comes back a couple times to haunt Jekyll. It's like it's, it's, it's stuck in his head. Uh, it, you know, you, you'll see the general repeating that in his head. But also, one thing to comment about the dance scene is that Dad also compared it with, you know, the, the first class existence versus the squalor that we see later in the film. Yes. Comparing, you know, the life of Dr. Jekyll versus the life of uh, Edward Hyde, which is really pretty interesting, although, like, the squalor isn't really squally, I guess, <laughs> to put it to put it in a way. But... Well, the, the house that we see is Ivy Pearson, and she has some nice things, but as we'll learn, she got those nice things by, by doing some not-so-savory things. Let's just put it that way. So anyway... Back to this, the, uh, Lanyon and Dr. Jekyll are walking back uh, through kind of the darker side of town, quote unquote, which, you know, you saw the, like like William said, you saw the the upper crust, the upper class area, and now you get the juxtaposition of the, the cheap side, as it were. You know, the light side of the moon versus the dark side of the moon. Yeah, the yin, the yin and yang, right. So the shadow and the light. So Dr. Jekyll is showing that he could. He said, I could have strangled the general. It's a pity I didn't strangle the old walrus. Did you hear it? Wait. Wait. What the devil does one wait for? I know that we say those things, and, and some people do say, man, I could have killed him. And, and, but, but people don't really go ahead and do those things. That's what's interesting, is he's saying those things, and you're like, uh. But it comes back to haunt you because you're going to let that all out. So uh, he, he, may, he may have some repressed anger issues, so to speak, and he's going to unrepress them. So they're walking back to the house, and they, they, see this, they hear this man throttle a woman, and she cries out. This is Ivy Pearson. Um, she's hurt, uh, but I don't think very badly. Uh, Dr. Jiggle gives the guy thrashing and takes Ivy back up to her room. She is very thankful for his help, but she's kind of acting like she's hurt a little more than she really is. Uh, like on her leg or on her stomach, just so he'll massage it or touch it. Uh, yeah, she's she's basically going, you know. She's oh, flirting. She kind of is, but she she likes the attention. I think thus is the way of the streetwalker. But this, look, that's if you think about it, that's that's how she relates to men. Uh, let's let's have a little bit of kindness for for Ivy, as we'll see. You know, I, I that may be her only you know thing that she can do. Uh, I mean, she's probably not very educated. Nor she can she make any money really any other way, considering yeah, the and, availability of jobs for women having yeah. increased over the years and being very thin in back in these old days, back 90 years ago. Yes. Uh, the thing about Dr. Jekyll is he is, in, he is and should be in, in complete control of his choices. Um you know, he but he gives his choice and in, uh, in the matter completely to Jekyll and or G, I'm sorry to Hyde and that that's the problem. So uh, anyway, this is the part that kind of is kind of salacious, so to speak. It doesn't really show anything. It's probably on the it's probably on the edge of I would call partial. It doesn't really show anything really fully. It shows a, a bare leg and some of her back, whatever. It does take its time. She takes off her her paint her, her hose. And her garters and throws it at us because we're it's showing it from our point of view. So in a way, it's kind of going, "Hey, you like to look at me, don't you?" You know, she really likes hands, touching hands, reaching out, 
touching me, touching you, sweet, <laughs> sweet. Caroline. Ba -ba -da. <laughs> good times never felt so good. <laughs> are you gonna? Are you just gonna make me do that anytime in the podcast? Anytime, anytime. Anytime you want. All right. So by showing that point of view, you're also going, okay, that's what Dr. Jekyll's looking at. He's looking at her. That's not really nice. And in particular, when he leaves the scene, Dad noted that they overlay the her shaking her leg at him, like trying to be like, ooh, look at it. Come back. Come back soon. And it overlays for like a solid 25 seconds. So that's how long he's thinking about it, even while he's going about his daily life. There's some nice overlays just to kind of sh uh, to, to show you that... They just have really great control over their fade-outs to the point that they can make it overlaid for, like, so long. And it's like, how do they even, like, really do it? I've never really thought of it. It's one of the easiest things to do because... You know, uh, the 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 harder probably thing was probably doing the first person shots and doing the uh, the color filter thing they did for the transformation or those spinning deals um, and the but unchanged they got, shots. But they got the fading into oh, great control. Fading is something that they you got know, into fading, great control. Fade, fading and back overlaying. in the LES so. and, the, and the jump the jump cut. And the so, jump cut, yeah. They got that as part. They when they found out that they could do that early on with cinematography, they were just like. This is this is art. We're going to make art with this. You know, it's not just, oh, we're just making a little silly, you know, animation or whatever. No, they that's when they wanted to be fantastical and make art. So Lanyon leaves after getting a kiss as his fee for investigating into um, Ivy. Well, here's the thing. Lanyon comes in the, into the room just as Ivy is kissing uh, the do Dr. Jekyll and it's like his fee. He is like upset at that because he's like you have you're gonna have a yeah, fiance. Yeah, you know you have a fiance. You need to you really need to keep it under control or else you're gonna you know lose that fiance once she figures out what you've been doing. Perhaps you've forgotten you're engaged to Muriel. Forgotten it? Can a man dying of thirst forget water? And you know what would happen to that thirst if it were denied water? If I understand you correctly, you sound almost indecent. What names you give things? Yeah, and Lanyon thinks that Dr. Jekyll's being indecent, and, and this is while the leg is, is on screen, so you know that that might still be in, uh, in Jekyll's mind. So Jekyll says the only way he can truly be clean in thought and deed is to perform his experiment and separate the good and the bad self. So in the next scene, this is great, Dr. Jekyll's mixing together the ingredients for the formula for the potion. In a way, you're like, oh, it must be really highly scientific, but he's like a little pinch of this a little drop of that almost like he's making a recipe being very exact well we say that but he looks like he's making a recipe or he's just like okay he's like he's just trying things out it's almost like a drug you know th there's a lot of drug reference in this because they talk about you know don't drink that potion anymore and you're like oh you know like a little bit of the a uh, little bit of the bubbly you know a little bit of the alcohol it I, is it just me or did or can alcoholic people that are dealing with alcoholism kind of re relate to this? Because addiction is sin. So, well, ba well, basically, if you treat it black and white, it is addiction's a struggle, and it's a struggle that that I think that that no one ever really uh, is. You you just struggle against it, and you don't give in. I don't think it's a it's a illness that you ever are truly healed from. Uh, I've known a lot of addicts and things like that, and and they there's no moment where they go, I'm healed, and you can put drugs and alcohol in front of my nose and I just won't be tempted, but you will. Uh, you just have to struggle against it and seek a better way. But anyway. But anyway, he he also writes a letter to Muriel um, in case that he dies. He writes it very fast. They sped it up for funniness, I guess. Maybe just to be like, you know, frantically just going like, oh, I have to write this really quick. <laughs> So <laughs> he also writes letters, I think, a couple times in this picture. So any other time they speed it up, it's just funny. I think they want to get to that that sweet, sweet transformation. What I was going to say is that when he, interestingly enough, he drinks a potion and becomes a beast of a man. How is that not, you know, drunkenness and, and, and rage? So his butler comes in and says, you're, you're not eating well. Of course, it's probably because he's really digging into trying to you know, make this formula and it's taking all his time. So he, he locks the door and he goes and he drinks it. 
I did want I did want him to say bottoms up, but before he drank it, but he this didn't is do not it. Alice in Wonderland, though. <laughs> right. So um, this is the first transformation we see. Um, it's not full on dilapidated kind of beast man, but uh, it gets to that point later. It does. Like it's almost a deterioration as he as he goes further in, into hide mode. So like William said before, the effects of the color changing skin have a really simple explanation, but they look really good on screen. They just do. Some people at the like didn't you say that some people in the theater gasped? Um, it would definitely make sense. I think they did. Uh he staggers to the ground and the cameraman gets to do a spinning effect and make us all woozy. We see a flashback of Henry saying that he wanted to strangle the general. All sorts of stuff that he did. Yeah, people calling him disgusting or indecent. Uh, you know, uh, Ivy saying, come back, come back. So then we switch back to first person view. We go to the mirror and we see Hyde for the first time. Free! Free at last! Man, hey, Lennon. Hey, Carol. Deniers of life. If you could see me now, what would you say? Hmm? <laughs> he looks very uh, ape-like with fang teeth. And an extended head as well. Yeah, the Barrymore version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde uh, is pretty unique, and it's more arachnid. He he, he, he hunches. Is, I would not think he'd be arachnid. Well, he hunches. Though. He hunches down, and his arms are kind of spindly. It's almost like he's spidery kind of guy. They guys. do Look. kind of make him like a hunchy, spidery kind of person in yes. the book, as far as I can tell. But, oh, okay, okay, yeah. So. And it isn't in, in the book? Isn't isn't he even like smaller in terms of his size? He's yeah, like, I guess so. Well, a lot of, uh, especially this one, they make him the say either the same size or bigger. Uh, there is, a but movie, in general, he is an ape throughout this whole thing. Ape like, yeah. There's a movie based upon a comic book that's. Yeah, definitely to adult, but it's called uh, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And it basically, it proposes that a lot of characters from literature are real, like the Invisible Man's formula, like uh, Dr. Jekyll is real. Frankenstein is real? Well, well, they they don't mention Frankenstein in this, but Tom Sawyer is real. Uh, if Frankenstein was around, it would have been back in the 1700s. This takes place in 1885 or something like that. Yeah. Mina Mina Harker from Dracula is in this, and she has been turned into a vampire, so she does vampire powers. It's basically like, what if we had the X Men, but they were but they were all literary characters? And Doctor Jekyll is in this when he turns into Mister Hyde. He's this. He's almost like take take Mister Hyde in this and mix him with the Hulk, and that's what he looks like. Anyway, so we'll have to see that uh, one day. But also, he really does try and act completely different from G- from uh, Jekyll. Well, how how so? Frederick Marx tries his best, you know, he makes his movements more, like, animalistic, and he really does, he really does also stretch a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 when, when he, he, he stretches a lot once he becomes Hyde for the first time. It's like he's been cooped up inside, you know, that he's been held back, and, you know, like, like he's, like he's uh, inside a cage. So Hyde is, is is dressed to go out, and the butler is going to come back in, and, and Hyde has to uh, drink the potion again, turn back into Dr. Jekyll. He um, unlocks the door, and so we're like kind of teased with it. We're like, oh, dang, I want to see Hyde do something. But, well, we think that, but uh, he turns back, and Poole, the butler, uh, he tells him that, uh, he says, who was that voice I heard? Oh, that that was my, my friend, uh, Edward Hyde. He, he'll be... Uh, coming and going and, and you know, through the back door. So make sure to keep it open. Yes, which is interesting because, you know, the back door is in the alley and it leads into the more, uh, the not great areas of town. And the front door is more upscale and it's kind of across the street. So if you think it's kind of a separation in a way. Anyway, so Dr. Jekyll meets with Muriel and she informs him that they have to go away for a couple weeks. Uh, Dr. Jekyll's pushing the marriage thing, and he wants to go to Paris for a honeymoon. He's really going crazy with waiting on this marriage. He looks like he's going out of his skin. Uh, the butler comes in and gives the letter to Dr. Jekyll from Muriel and says that they're going to be gone for another month. And it's like and it's... If, if we didn't say this before, she 
couldn't actually go to marriage um, because number one, the father wouldn't, and then second of all, she went on a vacation to Bath. So to Bath, <laughs> therefore, yeah. she had to stay there for a couple months. I don't know. Maybe it's because he was just like, you know what? Um, I can't, I, I can't do anything else to prevent this marriage. I'm just gonna transport you without your willingness just so that you can't marry for an extra three months. Right. I don't think she's doing it on purpose at all. You know, really, she she just wants him to be patient. And and it's and honestly, it's his fault for not being patient. She's being steadfast, right? So Poole suggests that Jekyll amuse himself in London. You're like, thanks, Poole. But then since his standards are so high and he's like, no, I'm not going to go out and, you know, sin amongst the cafes and the bars. <laughs> right. We do, and There's something in the room that's interesting. We see this pot with a stew in it. That's that's bubbling, and it boils every, every time that Hyde seems to come up. Or the yeah, same. it's it's kind of like a metaphor for what's going on inside of Jekyll, right? So Jekyll mixes the formula and unleashes Hyde. Uh, Edward puts on his cape and top hat, uh, the infamous appearance, and he heads out into rainy London. This part is great because he is he is exulting in the rain. He's like instead of like I'm going to put up an umbrella to keep this off my face, he just. He puts his face in it. He loves it. He lets it run all over his face. And I think that 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 like an he's like an animal. He hasn't really experienced it before. And rain also smells very naturalistic and earthy, concerning that you know Ooh. it evaporates up from the earth. Yeah, and, that's true. Um, that's true. The, the dirty water, the underground rivers, and stuff. And animals, you know, they don't really always have shelter. Sometimes they just run out in it. You know, he could just stay at home where it's safe. But no, he's going to go out into that rain. And be, you know, supernatural. So Hyde goes to Ivy's flat because he remembers that she, that's where she was, but she's not there. The landlady uh, tells him Ivy performs at this club, the Variety Music Hall, which is the most generic name for a club I've ever heard of. But it's got a lot of variety to it, you know? Does it really? It's got men and women. Totally tons of men as well as women. No, it doesn't have variety. It's, it does no, not have variety. It has only women. Only a variety one. show is basically just like we might have singing and we might have dancing and here's here's something to drink and here's uh, some woman yeah that's it so Hyde pokes uh pokes at her with his cane as he's leaving to show that he's kind of he's kind of a playful rascal um but he's 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 poking her up through the stair things and it's it's rude so anyway Hyde comes into the club or the music hall and it looks like he's just itching to fight because he it just he'll bump into somebody anybody that looks at him a scance or a skew, he like, he starts doing like the chest bumping kind of thing like people used to do in high school. He's very impatient. If you thought Jekyll he's was very, impatient. He's a very, very brash person. He is. He, he's, he's always like If five, anyone six, gets in the way of what he wants, then he will just punch them and punch them and punch them until they cripple down to the floor, basically. Yeah, yeah. He's very impatient. It's like uh, Jekyll's impatience times 100. So he And he's not a great tipper either. So listen to me. Be a good tipper if you're getting good service from waitstaff, okay? That's my lesson to you today, William. So the waiter calls Hyde a blighter as he walks away, and Hyde trips him with his cane. Uh, any, anybody makes a comment on it, he wants to fight him. Uh, Hyde looks across the room, and there's Ivy Pearson. She's singing... For everybody, but she's hanging around a particular yeah, he guy. Finally, he finally found her after the looking around, after, you know, seeing on the stage the the two women dancing, and in particular focusing on them as well as something you'll notice Yeah, as well. And um, so he finally finds Ivy, and Ivy is singing Champagne Ivy is my name. Champagne Ivy is my name. Champagne Ivy is my name. So Hyde tells the waiter he wants to meet with Ivy. Uh, she takes uh, a bit of, of champagne with Hyde. Uh, but, but she was talking to a guy, and that guy left for a moment, which, which that comes up. Uh, but she's not seeing that this guy is really, this Hyde guy is really all that great. She wants to leave and go At home. At first she was like, ooh, I like a man with a challenge. But then she realized that he is just a brute and is not really a good boyfriend. <laughs> right, he even insults her apartment like he knows what it He's is. Like, which... you, you living out here in Travis Court, man? He offers rich things and nice pretty things to be his girlfriend. And she, she says, and how am I to get it? And Hyde says, how do you think you're going to get it, my bright little bird? And that, that kind of hints that 
I'll give you all these nice things if if you'll do things that are uh, not good. I'm no gentleman, no. but I have money. So anyway. And he also refers to her as different types of birds throughout this movie, and also later, as you'll see, there's another thing connected to birds, which um, I'll discuss as well, but <laughs> oh, is that's it, really interesting. Is it the cat and the bird later? Yes. Okay, so you'll see what he means by that. So if she loves him, he'll pay her and give her gifts. He says he's not one of the handsome gentlemen that talks about her garter while liking her legs. Um, he's referring to Jekyll. He was inside Jekyll's mind because he is Jekyll. He was referring to the fact that Jekyll talks about her garter being too tight and you shouldn't do that. And Hyde is like, I'm going to compliment your legs straight out because I don't, I don't care. But he does keep calling her, uh, yes, a bird, but he keeps calling her it. Well, well, it's afraid of me, isn't it? It's easier to abuse somebody if you depersonalize and dehumanize them, make them an object like an it. So the guy she was talking to, he comes back, and he's jealous. So Hyde breaks a bottle and threatens him, and he leaves. Ivy wants to go, but Hyde won't let her. He says, You see, I hurt you because I love you. I want you. What I want, I get. And William, this is Abuser Speak 101. This is a thing you hear time and again with abusive relationships. So Even still, he's kind of like... Grant you, I am no beauty, but under this exterior, you find a very flower. Yeah, and I think that comment <laughs> is absolutely untrue. Find a very flower. In fact, I don't. He's like, oh, you you must understand, I'm actually a really good person when he's not. Well, the, the, only, if, the only good in him is Jekyll trapped inside. Yeah, Jekyll's trapped inside, however, so maybe you will find the very flower of a man. But yeah, but I'm not, I'm not going to let him out, right. I'm not going to let him out. Lanyon visits Jekyll's, uh, Jekyll's house, but Jekyll's out. Uh, Lanyon tells Poole that Muriel has not gotten any letters from Henry. Um, Poole tells Lanyon that Jekyll is rarely seen and, and in his lab usually when not out. And is uh, he's not been seeing his patients either. And so this is because obviously he's going out as Hyde and doing mis- miscellaneous activities. And Lanyon uh, is getting suspicious. So Ivy is in her flat. Uh, the landlady, Mrs. Hawkins, we'll see her a couple times. She brings her the newspaper. She tries to tell her that somebody else is asking after Ivy and wants to meet her. She's basically saying, you know, there's a guy that's interested in you, but she doesn't want to know who it is because Hyde would probably kill him uh ivy is nervous and scared and she's not her cheerful self we'll see that the cheerful self is gone but however hyde comes in yes he's literally just taken over her and her home she's he's he literally just grabs the newspaper and he's like you want lying to me are you my little bird no no, no i ain't lying to you if i ever catch you lying these are a trifle to what you'll get a trifle <laughs> He just, he grabs the newspaper, and then he sits on her bed reading it, and the shot of the newspaper, again, this is a Dracula staple, I guess. <laughs> this was also in Dracula. Oh, with the so. zoom-in thing? Yeah, with the, the newspaper shot, yeah. So, so, th- but this is thing, he's, he comes in, he's manipulative, he's, he wants to know uh, where she's been, what she's doing, what she's saying, this is very, this is controller this is very controller uh, territory. He's literally just taking over her, her home, and everything and her she stuff. loves. Yeah. And basically, to sum it up, hippity-hoppity, your soul is now my property. Right. So Hyde reads in the paper that, that Sir Danvers uh, Carew and Muriel Carew are planning to return to London. This is really rough scene. He starts psychologically messing with Ivy about whether she hates him or loves him. And he says he is going away for a few days, and she cannot hide her relief that he's leaving, which upsets him. And he is torturing her psychologically. This is what he says. If you do one thing that I don't approve of while I'm gone, the least little thing, mind you, I'll show you what horror means. That's, uh, that's a freaky statement. So uh, he dangles the possibility of his leaving before her eyes and then snatches it away again. I'm going to spend the evening here with you, just as you want. Say just as I want. 
Say just as I want. Just as I want. That's right, my little bird. The last evening is always the sweetest, you know. And he forces her to speak, to sing, Sing. to beg him to stay with her. And also, wait, do you hear that? What is that? Oh, no. It's the Phantom of the Opera, obviously. When you command someone to sing, sing for me, darling, it's always the Phantom of the Opera. But he's not abusive, really. He's just... Yeah, I I, I would say that that the Phantom has his issues. But honestly... He's not as abusive as Hyde. He's not abusive as Hyde. But the one thing is I'll show you what horror means since we're covering horror movies. I feel like that's... (laughs) <laughs> that's the quote of the century for horror movies is I'll show you what horror means. Yep. After he's turned her into his puppet, uh, he can he drives her into a fit of hysteria and she just emotionally and physically collapses. And then once she's like has no power, he takes what he wants laughing and we cut to black. Thank the Lord, because Lord knows what he has in mind. So now in the next scene, we see Jekyll as Jekyll again. And he's looking over Muriel's scattered letters that he has on his desk. And She's also... literally been messaging him a ton of times, and he doesn't even care because he's just – he's like, I've got another woman. Man, that girl been texting you nonstop, bro. So – and also the key to the back door of the laboratory, he's holding it, which is kind of him musing about what he's done and what his hide has done, the consequences of actions, right? The the key to, uh, to a door um, – is you know like a pathway to to, to, the to sin. sin to sin and desire and evil and urges. It, it's like holding the top of a cookie jar while staring at the cookie jar. I I didn't think about that. Yeah, Basically. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So Jekyll thinks about it and he discards the back door key. He hands it to Pool and says, "I have no further use for it." We're like because he's like, I've been too much as Hyde. I'm just gonna get rid of this key. I'm going to lock the door. I'm not going to sin anymore. But thing is, he does. Yeah, so, yeah, he we'll find that. We'll find that. But Jekyll uh, sends Pool to Ivy's house with a 50-pound note, which I don't know what that is in in It's, uh, it's in a lot American of money dollars. because he's trying to apologize for absolutely abusing her as yeah, well as, you know, he, noticing he, that she doesn't have that much money and going, you know what, have some money. You know what, I'll look up 50 pounds to dollars. Is he pay- is he paying her to keep quiet, or is he paying her for goods and services? That should be sixty dollars. It's very respectable. Well, but that's not, back that's then modern. it would be different. Back then it would be different. This is modern money. It would convert yeah. to sixty dollars. You'd have to convert to uh, you know what it was inflation wise. So it would probably be like I don't know eight hundred or something. Wow, yeah, that's crazy. So we'll just we'll just say well yeah we'll just say it's eight hundred. Believe us. Do-do-do. All right, so. Is he giving her that money to kind of uh, absolve his own guilt? That's a possibility. So Poole says that the money is from Dr. Henry Jekyll, and Ivy says, I don't know Dr. Jekyll. She knows what he looks like, but not his name. So she. So then she explains that, you know, he's well-respected, and he's a fine gentleman who would actually probably be better for you. Well, well, it's, 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 he's, he's helpful with his work with poor people. So I think even Mrs. Hawkins knows that uh, that he's helped out in the free wards, and so that that's probably why she knows about and Dr. Jekyll. And she knows that his philanthropy is good philanthropy, so take the money, basically. We also do see, you know, Ivy shows, uh, I believe she shows Mrs. Hawkins her back, and that's uh, his, his Hyde's farewell gift was a whipping across the back, which, yeah, yikes. That is definitely something an abuser would do concerning that they have to own a object, a specific object, and then use that object. So <laughs> no one well, would really own a whip unless you are Dr. Moreau. Yes. Uh, and then then again, Dr. Moreau is an abuser. He, he is. is an he, abuser he is. to his gorilla minions. So <laughs> his, his minions. In another scene, uh, Jekyll's trying to explain to Muriel all the different actions that he's done that were hurtful. He doesn't go into detail, though. He's um, like, I've walked a dark, dark, dark road. Yeah, he doesn't go into, into too much deep territory. She, she, can, she can see that he is dealing with a lot. So then we get the split screen with both of the characters, Muriel and Ivy, both balanced on the screen, which is really interesting. Yeah, Ivy has the whip marks being shown, and Muriel has a complaint that Jekyll has made me suffer so. Very so fascinating. So that's very interesting. Um, but Jekyll, like you said, he only 
the only says, I played with dangerous knowledge and I've got an illness of the soul. He says, help me find my way back. It sounds like he is... He knows that he is sinning. He knows that Hyde is a bad thing, which is why he threw away that key. But the thing is, um, as we see later, he still turns into Hyde anyway, somehow. So Muriel's father uh, finally agrees to an immediate marriage. Uh, the thing is, had Muriel been a bad daughter sooner and defied her father and got married anyway, is it possible that all that tragedy might have been averted? Or would he have, you know, tried to, to uh, while they were married, get rid of his, you know, his urges? You know, the, the sin, sinful urges you have, just getting married is not going to take care of it. So then we get Ivy Pearson, then comes to Dr. Jekyll for counseling and advice and also to return her note because she didn't really want it. Um, she does... Um, this scene hits pretty hard concerning that she's literally in massive misery and a abuse victim. And... She does... Uh, she also recognizes him. She's like, Dr. Jekyll, oh, that you're the guy that helped me out that... You, oh, you're you're that sweet man. So uh, she also begs him, uh, if, you, if you can't help me directly, at least help me kill myself. Okay. And she also wants that, to yikes. enslave herself. And we'll play the clip here. He won't let me go, and I'm afraid. I'm afraid to run away. I tried to drown myself, but I can't. And if you don't help me, you is as the kindest heart in the world, sir. Then get me poison so I can kill myself. Why didn't you seek help before? Why didn't you go to the police? I was afraid. You don't know him, sir. He ain't a man. He's a devil. He knows what you're thinking about. He does. I'm afraid of him. I'm afraid of him now. If he knows that I've been here today, I don't know what he'll do. It won't be anything human, sir. Oh, save me. Save me. Give me more of me. I'll do anything you ask. I'll be your slave. Oh, help me. But also, and that, here's my also my reaction to the slave, which I was just incredulous. Um, also, there might be some background noise, so if you hear that, just so you know. I'll be your slave. But Hyde, you're already slave to Hyde. What do you mean? I'll be your slave. If you're already slave, how is that better? And I was just like, she's going so hard that she wants to literally addendum mortis. And she also literally wants to enslave herself. And I was like, you're already enslaved to Hyde, so... <laughs> well, she, she she thinks that the Dr. Jekyll will be a kind master. That even if I get to work for you and, you know, kind of like, you know, I'll clean the house, you know, just like Pool or Pool goes and opens the door and gets your clothes ready and I'll, I'll clean the house or whatever. If you do that, it'll protect me from Hyde. The thing the is, he will turn into Hyde and then you will be donezo. She's asking for help from the very man who did it. So um, now Jekyll says, this is something interesting. Uh, why didn't you go to the police? And she says, I was afraid. If he knows as I've been here today... I don't know what he'll do. But why didn't you go to the police? That's what people say to victims of domestic abuse a lot of times. Uh, why didn't you leave? Why didn't you help yourself? Well, some people were too terrified to leave, too terrified to seek help, and too terrified to move, and too terrified to even breathe almost. So I, if you're not in that situation, it's very difficult to But if you are in that why. situation, then you should probably get help is one thing. If you're in an abusive relationship... It does not matter if he's going to literally slaughter you, as we'll see at the end, round to end this movie, spoilers, but the police is a much better solution. Yeah, and there are people that, that, that are going to believe you. Some people are like, I'm not going to believe you, no matter what you say, and I know that that's a big deal right now. But, but fortunately, yeah. Hyde, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Jekyll, then he goes, you know what? You're never going to see Hyde again. Everything will be good. Yeah, the next scene, uh, we, we see him going to the formal dinner party where he's going to announce uh, the marriage that General Carew has a approved of, right? So he's walking through the park. Oh, here we go. So he's walking through the park, you know, enjoying the trees and stuff. And, you know, there's a nightingale in the tree. And um, he quotes a poem 
Um, it's Keats. called by Keats, and it's called "Ode to a Nightingale." The quote is, "Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down." The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by Emperor and Clown. He repeats back, "Thou wast not born for death," but a cat slinks up the tree and goes after it, and this it's it's a primal blood spilling you know it's it's nature is 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 red in tooth and claw i've heard you know dog eat dog world dog eat dog eat dog world in fact yeah so. uh so hyde is back with a vengeance and he just appears without the need for the potion um it is i think uh, i will tell you this right now sometimes there, there there's a situation okay I, I just thought about this um there is a a uh a drug called lysergic acid or LSD, right? Or otherwise known as acid. And you take a little tab of it and put it on your tongue and you hallucinate. And it's such a powerful hallucination. And some people have said, even when I'm, when I haven't done it years later, I'll have what's called a flashback or I have like a, I will actually have that, have a, a strong hallucination without the acid, even in my system. It'll, it's in my system still. And it comes back out. So I was just thinking about that, that that it, maybe it's like acid. He just, it's, it's, it's in him. But yeah, he was just like, you know, I want to enjoy my day. I want to go and get my marriage out because, you know, I'm, I'm just so happy that I'm finally actually going to be allowed to marry. And, um, is it, is it, is it, is it when, uh, when Jack, when Jekyll is happy, Hyde is like upset. It's like, he's the reverse. Maybe, but I, I there's another quote as well from an earlier scene where okay. he's preparing to go out uh, into the park. And um, so this is a quote from Romeo and Juliet, which is uh, Shakespeare. And um, I think this was from the context clues of not having read the entire thing front and back, obviously. Yeah. The context clues from summaries and such. I think this is like after they've had like a secret wedding and um, Romeo is exiled for dead. And, um, in fact, he's even going to go out and take a potion after this scene. Ah. Um, so... See, there's that, there's that potion taking. So, Rome, so Juliet is just absolutely down in the dumps, because she's just sad about, you know, he's exiled, he's gonna die sometime. He actually does die, but she doesn't know that, and, um... He's just like, there is no sunshine here, it's just a nightingale that's really bad. And then Romeo's like, no, it's not. It's a lark. You know, the night's candles are burnt out, and Yoken Day stands tiptoe on the misty mountain tops. I should be gone and live or stay and die. So he's like, I've got to do this. I've, if I stay here, I'm going to die. It's interesting that, there, that, that there's a lark and a nightingale in both these scenes. It's kind of like instead of turning things for an upside, she's turning things into darkness. Which is oh. really interesting. And there's also parallels to this since Romeo takes a potion and dies. Um, well, in general, he takes a potion, which is, you know, one one point on the Dr. Jiggle, Mr. Hyde front. And another point is that after the scene, he's going to go and die. And look what happens in this movie. Spoiler alert. Well, taking the potion makes Hyde alive. Taking the potion makes Hyde dead. All right, so Hyde doesn't go... To the West End, uh, which is where Muriel is, but he goes towards Soho, where Ivy is. And as he's running off, we do get a really great shot where, you know, Hyde's running. He's running away from the park while there's a crane shot going down to Muriel, both overlaid diagonally, which is really interesting. You know, diagonal separation of, like, the crane shot, which is something that, you know, the unchained camera. And the other thing is... um also an unchained camera concerning they'd have to bring it outside but still well this the, the split screen you know juxtaposition of shots all right so um okay yeah mural's waiting on one, on one end and she's probably and on the other end there's hi. two cell there's two celebrations ivy is celebrating by herself with champagne to champagne ivy um she's celebrating hyde's permanent departure this is so scary she believes that it's permanent because jekyll Jekyll told her so. She toasts her own reflection in the mirror because she has no one else to toast with. She toasts, toasts Jekyll. He's an angel, he is. Here's to you, my angel. The door swings open in the reflection and reveals Hyde. And it's there he freak, is. It's freaky. Ivy is doomed, and we know it. And we he's all just know it. like, 
you know, Jekyll told, uh, Jekyll told you that I wasn't coming back, but I am, um, just because, and you're like, you know, you went down on his knees, however, he gives a epic reveal. Yeah, yeah, he says, he says, um, I know everything you do and everything you think. You went down on your knees. The man I hate more than anybody in the world. No, I'll slay for you. I love you. You're an angel, sir. You wanted him to love you, didn't you? I'll give you a lover now. His name is Death. And he also reveals... I am Jekyll. I am the angel whom you wanted to slay, fall in They're the same person, which has got to be freaky. All right, so uh, he cl- his hands clench around her throat, uh, Ivy, and, and kills her. She screams. She's trying to scream. She's trying to run away. Hyde is doing his stunts with the stunt actor, doing a pretty good job as well for this, being like a being like a animal um, as well, which is really cool. He does do this a lot, especially in the final chase scene, as we'll get to. But yeah, Ivy's dead. Ivy's dead now. And also, as he kills her, we also get um, Cupid and Psyche as well. A lot in of the ba- In the background? Stuff, a lot yeah. of background. Yeah, there's a little bit of mythological callback to that. Maybe, maybe it was on purpose, maybe not. But knowing uh, Ruben Mamoulian uh, and his direction... Uh, I would say it's on purpose because he's, he likes putting those little elements in there. Um, you know, he, nothing nothing is, is done on accident. Which so, I, yeah, Hyde is trying to escape to back to his home, but he can't because Poole doesn't recognize him. And he thinks he's just a – he's a bad person overall, which I would think so as well. Uh, he is, yeah. And um, since Jekyll wasn't punctual and he didn't arrive to the dinner <laughs> and the dinner's already over – then General Crow is like, you know what? I forbid you, Muriel. It's done. You're never gonna be able to see him again. He may have had good reason, and he, and, you know, and he and was gonna turn into Hyde anyway. And then what would happen to poor Muriel? Okay, <laughs> She'd so be dead too. Muriel is. She says uh, something terrible must have happened to keep Jekyll from her. Uh, Doctor like, Lane, I know he's gonna come back, and um, he does. Basically, Doctor Doctor Lanyon uh, gets home to find a note waiting for him. It's a note in Jekyll's handwriting asking him to get certain items from Jekyll's laboratory. Uh, Lanyon does does that, but when Hyde calls for them, he finds Lanyon armed with a pistol and uncooperative. Uh, Lanyon insists upon knowing what has happened to Jekyll. Uh, he's talking to Hyde. Hyde says, Do you want to be left as you are? Or do you want your eyes and your soul to be blasted by a sight that would stagger the devil himself? I'm not to be persuaded by this rigmarole. Very well, Lanyon. Remember your vows to your profession. What you are about to see is a secret you are sworn not to reveal. Now, you who have sneered at the miracles of science, you who have denied the power of man to look into his own soul, you who have derided your superiors, look, look. So then Hyde then drinks the formula that he got out of the, the package that he was requesting, and he drinks it, and he's Jekyll, and Lanyon is just shocked while he's just, he just stumbles over and he goes, Well, well, let, let's, let's put it this way. Lanyon, honestly, the actor who plays Lanyon really should be shocked more, but I wonder if he didn't really see the transformation, you know, in, in done on screen. And, you know, if he I did w- not know this before, so right. then he's basically, Jekyll's just going, you know, I've done a terrible thing. Um, I'm never going to do it again. There is no help for you, Jekyll. You've committed the supreme blasphemy. I warned you. I told you that no man could violate the traditions of his kind and not be damned. That I still do not believe. Don't be my inquisitor, man. And don't judge me. Help me, if you will. Well, I'm at your mercy. There is no help for you here. Or mercy beyond. You're a rebel. And see what it has done for you. You're in the power of this monster that you've created. Uh, Jekyll almost sounds like an addict here. Where this co- in this conversation? Never take that drug again. Yes, but you told me you became that monster tonight, not of your own accord. It will happen again. Never, I'm sure of it. I'll fight it. I'll conquer it. Too late. You cannot conquer it. It has conquered you. So after, like I said, after science fiction and horror movies that had uh, godless scientists 
and scientists who want to be God or tamper in God's domain. He does actually believe in the soul in the Christian sense. Um, he has his anguish at the end of the movie makes it really clear. Um, he even goes up to Muriel and he's just oh, yeah. renouncing his love for her and he's going, I'm never going to see you again. I have literally murdered somebody, uh, addenda mortis somebody. So <laughs> basically, yeah, he, he's, he's performing penance, <laughs> absolution, confession. These are all things that anybody that knows, uh, uh, the Catholic faith would understand or any kind of Christian faith. There's, there's absolution. There's, he wants to be, to be washed clean of this. And he's like, you know what? I'll even just, you know, if, if God wants me to, I'll give up our love. Uh, Muriel defies her father and wants Jickle to be let, let in. And she says, I haven't fought for him enough. And that's, that's really heartbreaking. So he renounces her and he kneels at her feet like Ivy did. And it's interesting. A lot of these scenes from here on to the end of the movie, uh, Jekyll or Hyde, uh, I would say Jekyll is lower down and everyone else is up. Like Muriel is here and he's at her feet, right? But when Hyde is around, he's always wanting to climb up. Interesting, huh? We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So, so uh, when he exits after getting his penance, he then he then turns into Hyde again, and then goes to attack Muriel. Muriel turns around and is like, "Oh!" She thinks it's she thinks it's Jekyll, and then just screams because Hyde and uh, General the Carew, police force and General well, Carew well, and, and everyone the butler, are, and the butler, well, uh, the whole everyone just commences a chase to stop him and they chase yeah, him but, around. Yeah, uh, but General Carew gets his gets his skull cracked with two hard thwacks from uh Hyde's walking stick, which is still it's Jekyll's walking stick too. So, yeah, so the police in the city folk, they're alarmed. They give chase and Hyde runs for the last time. This time he's able to enter Jekyll's house by the front door and he rushes to the laboratory when he starts to mix the potion. Remember that he comes down the stairs and everyone else is up and he's down. Which kind of shows, you know, that he's he's lower down in this in this. And hole. he does get a lot of really great stunt acting, especially you know jumping off like a balcony. Um, oh, he is hardcore as part parkour. of the chase. He is hardcore parkour. But so basically, they get all the way to him and they're like, "Stop him!" and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, get, get him and stuff. Well, well, but here's the thing: he takes the potion, he turns back into Jekyll, which I guess is his way of hiding. <laughs> so, and then when, but Lanyon has uh, seen. Uh, General Carew dead on the ground and picked up the broken cane and he goes, this is Jekyll's cane. So he goes, I know exactly what happened. I've seen the transformation. It's like, I can't I, I can't believe like that this person would do it, but it's him. It's gotta be him. None of you would believe it, but it is him. And it's like, this is your man. And then he literally transforms in front of him as he points. But wait, and... he, po he points, he, he says, there. And he points an accusing finger, and I love it that he that it's a first person shot. He's pointing. He's like, "There's your man," and he's pointing at us. So um, he goes under another transformation, I guess, through stress or whatever, into a drooping, drooping form of Hyde. His eyes just do, yeah. for five seconds as he is taking defensive position. Is this some of the stuff? Is this uh, is this some of the makeup that? Uh, it was said that Frederick March had such a hard... Yes, he went to the hospital right after the production ended, so... Yeah, thank goodness. I will tell you, this is his most famous part. I He's been in some other things, I'm sure, and I've, I've, I've looked into them, but this is the one that, that people most think of when they think of him, uh, and and thankfully so. Now, after, after he does get shot, he gets a knife, and they're like, oh, we got to shoot him. And he slowly, he slowly turns back into Jekyll, and then we get a nice shot of him being burned in the flames of his pot of the fireplace, as well as the movie ends. We see, yeah, we see. Well, we see the last thing we see is is it pulls away from uh, Hyde's, you know, dead uh, Je Jekyll's dead form uh, to the pot, and the pot is still kind of bubbling. So, is is hell over? For Dr. Jekyll, or is it just begun? But final thoughts on this film. Really it's great film. It's a really cinematic and fantastic film, indeed, I guess. But 
I was just incredulous at the fact that he just, he's dead. And um, I put this at the beginning where they were just playing like happy music at the end. I was like, oh, uh, this guy died. And um, you'll have to see the beginning for that. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. But overall, there's just so much legacy and goodness to this film and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in general that I do not believe that this one should have been buried. It's really, really great. It's Paramount's Frankenstein. Frankenstein's really great. This was Paramount's version of it. So. I would, I would agree. Now, it's also we will also see, you know, man trans. We'll see man transforming into beast many times. If it, you, you know, uh, I think another one we'll see is, uh, oh, uh, the Werewolf of London. I would say is very much inspired. Uh, is one, uh, the Wolfman with Lon Chaney Jr., who's Lon Chaney's son. Uh, of course, if you can tell by the name. And, of course, uh, the Hulk. There's a lot of different uh, transformative characters. Um, I think also there is a um, there's a picture that people did with that had a split face that had Jekyll on one side and Hyde on the other. Two-Face. That, that inspired Two-Face from Batman, exactly. There's just so much legacy that we can't name it, even still, like, when I was trying to name the legacy, that was on top of my head. I mean, I'm the one that remembers the Arthur song the most, so... But also, did you know that in the book, um, I did look this up, but um, did you know that at the end of the book, um, he actually doesn't get shot? He kills himself. With what? What, did he shoot himself in the head? Yeah, he just locks himself up, and everyone was like, where did he go for a bunch of months? They finally, <laughs> they finally got through the barricade on his door, and then he's just dead, and he's got a letter, and then commences the, the book. I haven't gotten... Like commences the story, but I haven't gone. Is it possible that far, he? But... Is it possible he poisoned himself? Yeah. Okay. So that was our podcast episode, and next up, um, you will be able to have the fortunate viewing, audio viewing pleasure, <laughs> right, of King Kong, the eighth wonder of the world, the King eighth Kong. wonder of the world, King Kong, nineteen thirty three. The Lord of Skull Island, uh, His Majesty. Uh, we will see a lot of Kong stuff, not just in the 30s, but uh, we'll see Kong stuff, um, Kong films uh, come back in the 60s and then beyond. There will, so, be, there will be no end to apes ever. But the thing is, this is the King Kong yes. that started it all. And we'll, we'll be really excited to that one next episode. Absolutely. And absolutely. So until then, we're signing off. Yeah. Don't don't uh don't hide from us. Don't you know. hide from us. <laughs> come back. Come back. Come back Next, soon. Yeah, come back soon. Come back. Next time, won't you? <laughs> Bye. Don't forget to open your third eye and telepathically message us at cinefanpod at gmail.com. Set your chronoscope dial to the future setting and peruse cinematicfanpodcast.wordpress.com. Hunker over your ham radio as your keen ears listen for the ghostly voices tweeting on our Twitter at cinematicfanta1. Exchange all of your money into Republic credits and donate at our Patreon page at patreon.com slash cinefanpodcast. Ending transmission now. Thank you.